Hello guys, good morning. Hello, good morning. Can, ev can everyone hear me now? Hello guys, good morning. Um, I will start again. So, this lecture is covered chapter six to seven. Actually, it's it, it is supposed to be chapter six to nine, but since um, there's a lot uh, to show a vi to um. To discuss on chapter eight to nine, then I divided the lecture into two. So I will open new uh, schedule on January twenty four, which is Friday. So because I'm here in the office that time, so I will do the lecture on Friday, and January twenty five for the rest of the lecture. Um, I will just repeat. For the announcement, please answer the pretest and post-test in Purdue Online. We are monitoring the Purdue Online account for your activity. So do not answer the progress test. We will inform you when to start the progress test. So just start the pretest and post-test in every every module. So for a tire and CSSD, once you enter the decontamination area or decontamination room, if you do, if you will not process any instruments to be uh, clean or deco to be decontaminated, then you just wear the following PPE: the scrub attire, your hair covering, and your intended shoes. If you are beard, if you have mustache, then you need to wear the beard cover. If you don't have the intended shoes, then you would need to wear the shoe cover. So the same in packaging and processing area, upon entering, you need to have the following hair scrub attire, hair covering, intended shoes, and beard cover. For processing area, once you de decontaminate or clean instruments, once you do the manual brushing, when, if you are dealing with the uh, soil instruments, then you need to, to wear the following PPE. Fluid resistant gown, two gloves, which is the first one is your inner gloves, and the, the second one is your outer gloves, which, which is the utility gloves. So the third PPE is your shoe cover. Even you uh, you are wearing the intended shoes, if you are processing, or cleaning uh, contaminated instruments, 
then you need to wear your shoe cover mask or respirator the reason why it it is written respirator because um you need to wear ppe which is indicated in your msds or in your material safety data sheet so if your msds set uh, said that if if your msds written there is that you need to to wear a respirator when dealing with that chemical then you need to wear respirator face shield is one of your equipment especially when you are decontaminating because you are prone to um eye splash or eye spill there are chem in doing manual brushing you are dealing with chemicals so it's um it's either you are using enzymatic cleaning or your decontamination um, decontamination solution for serial goods or storage area upon entering you need to wear your hair covering your scrub attire your intended shoes I think I, I really have a problem with with the connection but I okay and your beard cover. So this is your scrub attire. It depends on your facility if what is the color code coding of your facility uh, policy. There should be an intended um, scrub attire specific for CSSD. So if you are in the hospital, it is color coded as per your a hospital policy policy if you are in the medical center usually guys in the medical center they have one um scrub attire but it's it is mandated to have a separate separate color coding for cssd staff so your lab gown is your ppe it is the uh, it is designed to protect your scrub attire this is your scrub attire. Your lab gown will protect your scrub attire whenever you will go to another department of your facility. For example, to cafeteria within your facility, your pantry area, your clinical room area if you are sending instruments. Um, to HR. So you, you need to wear a lap gown whenever you will you will go to another department within or inside the facility this lap gown is not meant to protect you outside the facility so if you are smoking then you need to change your scrub attire to your street clothing so you are not allowed to wear your lap gown outside the facility just to smoke so this is your sample of beard cover so if you have mustache if you are a beard then you need to wear this one it is one of the mandatory requirements uh, to wear if you have a beard so for example, once you enter, you need to wear your scrub attire, your scrub suit, your hair net, your beard cover, and your intended shoes. So for CS temperature in your working areas, there are four areas, right? Um, your decontamination, general work area. General work area is your um, inspection and packaging area, and your sterile, sterile storage area, and your sterilization equipment room. So in your four, four areas, your, your decontamination is expected to be the coldest uh, room. It has 16 degrees Celsius to 18 degrees Celsius with 30 to 60 humidity and 10 air exchanges. For your general work area, it has 20 to 
22 degrees Celsius, 30 to 60 degrees. Uh, percent humidity and 10 air exchanges. It is the second coldest area for your sterile storage area is the third coldest area because um, it has 23 degrees Celsius. It is expected to have 23 degrees Celsius below with a humidity of 70, at least 70 percent with four air exchanges. For your sterilization equipment, it is one of the warmest or not hottest, but at least warm because of the temperature of at least 29 degrees Celsius. Actually, we can maintain the temperature and sterilization equipment room for at least 16 to 18 degrees. But in case we cannot maintain the temperature, then we are expected to maintain it until 23 degrees Celsius to 29 degrees Celsius. So with humidity of 30, 30 to 60%, and 10 air exchanges. So please be reminded for for an acronym of PASS4, P-A-S-S-4. -S so positive air pressure for sterile storage and for air exchanges. So in all areas, sterile storage has a different humidity level and also air exchanges level. So only sterile storage has the different if it, if we are talking with temperature, it is expected to have at least 16 to 18 for the contamination, 20 to 22 for general work area, at least 23 below for the serial storage. For serial equipment, it is the hottest or warmest, warm. So this is the summary. Cold room is your decontamination and warm room is your sterilization room, but it is a... Um, if you are not, if you cannot uh, maintain the temperature, then you are expected to have the 23 to 29 degrees Celsius. But you, you can, if you can maintain the 16 to 18 degrees in all room, it's okay. For processing of used instrument, your soiled instruments, when it is contaminated with um, soil, your blood, your pus, or feces or any um, tissues, then you need to do the processing from soiled area, the cleaning processing area, inspection to this inspection and packaging area to sterilization and storage area. So from cleanest to from dirtiest to the cleanest. For cleaning the CSS new room, if you are if you are assigned to uh, to clean the CSSD room or actually uh, guys it is mandated to clean the CSSD room every shift okay if you are only one shift then you are um, and you are required to clean the the CSSD room at least daily what before you will start once you have your early morning duty, uh, duty before you will start processing, you need to disinfect your um, work surfaces using surface disinfectant. So you will start from sterile storage area to the dirtiest, which is your decontamination area. So when cleaning the CSSD room, you need to start from top to bottom, okay? You will not start from bottom because if you are uh, wiping wet, uh, wet towels on the top part, then when you start the, on, on the bottom part, there, there is possibility there's a possibility from top it will fall down to the bottom. So it should be from top to bottom part. Okay, you will start from top, top part to bottom. So for cleaning the CSSD room, guys, there are infection control policy, which means that your uh, utility, de utility department or your utility personnel, they are designated to use a specific uh, equipment or cleaning equipment in the CSSD room. 
for example, it depends on the um, policy of your or, or of your company. Let's, for example, in our facility, we are using yellow, yellow bin, and yellow map, or whatever yellow it is, only for CSSD room. So for green map, you are uh, we are uh, using it in the general work uh, general areas, which is your hallway. And your red will be your communicable rooms. So it depends on your facility uh, policy, whatever map or color coding they will use. They will not, for example, they will not use your yellow map in other rooms, especially in clinical rooms, because it is expected to be contaminated. So when mapping uh, in CSSD room, it should be wet map. So you are not allowed to sweep the in any CSSD room because it can cause that the dust might rise. It will go on top level, and when when it 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 might lodge to any surfaces on top, then it can fall on your clean instruments. Once it fall on your clean instruments, then it can contaminate your clean instruments. So it is useless to process or your cleaning process if there's a dust coming to your instruments. So no food or beverages allowed in this area. Okay, the reason why You can spill uh, food or drinks into your clean instruments, or you can encourage um, insects or pests. That's the reason why it uh, food is not allowed in CSSD area. And the other thing is that um, as a safety protocols, as infection protocols, you are not allowed to eat because it might be a risk on your part as a CSSD technician, especially if you are processing um, instruments and you are handling chemicals and you are not doing hand washing, it, it can cause um, hazardous substance, in, uh, hazardous intake your body so that's the reason the the three main reason is that is safety of the personnel the second is that the food might get uh con might contaminate the instruments the third one is that you are encouraging um insects if ever it is that some of the your food particles are lodged in CSSD room so for PPE, for personal protective equipment, the dunning of PPE sequence one. So there are different types of dunning of PPE. Dunning is um, wearing your PPE. So upon entering, you need to wear your hairnet and intended shoes. So assuming you already wear your scrub attire, you already wear your scrub suit. So when you enter the CSSD room, you need to wear your hairnet and intended shoes. If you don't have intended shoes, then you will um, wear your shoe cover. So if you have intended shoes, this is your sequence. Once you process um, instruments in the decontamination area, once you brush, do the manual brushing, or once you mix a chemicals, then you need to wear this complete PPE. You need to start with gown, done the previous gown, tie, snap, or zip immediately. Wear your mask secure around the ear or tie the strings on the head. Fit the mask over nose area. Ensure the nose and mouth are completely covered. Done goggles or face shield. Actually, it's not goggles, guys. 
it's facial it is mandated to, to be a facial uh, already and adjust to fit properly the next is your shoe cover if you are wearing intended shoes, then you need to wear your shoe cover, done shoe cover, and ensure shoes are completely covered. Then, lastly, your gloves. Then you need to wear two gloves. Okay. If you are decontaminating instrument, you need to wear two gloves. One, the inner gloves, which extends beyond your wrist, and one is your utility gloves. If ever you are mixing chemicals, then you need to wear the green gloves or the chemotherapy graded gloves. Dunning of PPE sequence number two. Upon entering, you need to wear your hair net. And if you don't have intended shoes, wear shoe cover. You need immediately you need to wear shoe cover. And if ever you already have the shoe cover, then this is your sequence. You need to wear your gown. You need to wear your mask. You need to wear your face shield. Then instead, you, you will wear your shoe cover. You will remove it. I, I mean, you don't need to, to wear your shoe cover because you already have it. Okay, then lastly is your gloves. For duffing of, duffing of PPE, Duffing means removing, okay? In duffing of PPE, the complete sequence of removing PPE is you will start from shoe cover, okay? Next is your gloves, then your face shield, remove your gown, remove your mask, and lastly, you will remove your head cover. You will just remove your head cover If you are, just, please be reminded that you need, you will just remove your shoe cover if you all, if you will stay in the room and you have the intent, still, if you have the intended shoes, if you don't have the intended shoes, then you will not remove your shoe cover. You will remove, um, for your head covering, if you will stay on the room, if you will not go outside to other, other departments, is you can maintain your head cover, okay? But the complete sequence of duffing or removing is, for example, you you will you will go outside the CSSD room, then you need to remove all PPE. So shoe cover, gloves, face shield, gown, mask, and head covering. Sequence number two. So there are different sequence, okay? If in case, you are not wearing your shoe cover. Okay, you you have your intended shoes, and you you are not mixing or uh, doing uh, what you call that. You are not decontaminating decontaminating instruments, so you don't ha you just have your intended shoes. Then you need to remove your gloves, then face shield, then remove gown, remove head covering, and Remove your mask. So, dunning of PPA sequence number three. First is you need to remove your shoe cover. Remove gloves together with the gown. So instead of removing only your gloves, you can remove your gloves together with your gown. So if ever, guys, you are removing your gloves together with your gown, you can uh, attach outside gown and just grab your gown and then roll it and remove together with your gloves. If you remove your gloves, then next is your gown when you... For example, this one, when you remove your gloves first, then your face shield, then your gown, if you are, if you will remove your gown and you already remove first your gloves, then you will um, hold or you will touch your inner, inner part or inner gown, so inner part of your gown. 
So we will demo that one once you are here. So the duffing sequence number three, remove shoe cover, remove gloves together with gown, remove face shield, remove head cover, and then remove mask. So for duffing of PP sequence number four, remove gloves together with gown, remove face shield, head cover, and then remove mask. So for sepsis, guys, the word sepsis is a potentially life-threatening condition caused by the body response to an infection. So if we, we are um, pertaining to asepsis, which means it means no or absence of infection. So absence of microorganism that cause diseases is your asepsis. Sepsis is your presence of infection. So a septic technique any activity or procedure that prevents infection, either uh, hand washing or wearing PPE. That's your aseptic technique. Sterile technique, sterile is generally defined as meaning free from microorganism. For sterile technique, sterile is generally defined as meaning free from microorganism. Sterile technique involves strategies used in patient care to reduce exposure to microorganism and maintain objects in areas as free from microorganism as possible. Your clean technique means free of dirt, marks, or stains. Clean technique involves strategies used in patient care to reduce the overall number of microorganisms or to prevent or reduce the risk of transmission of microorganism from one person to another or from one place to another. So please be reminded for the principles of asepsis. First is know what is dirty. Second, know what is clean. Third is know what is sterile. The principle of asepsis you cannot uh, combine a dirty instrument with clean, okay, or clean to sterile instrument. So you need to separate them with each other. So dirty should be together with dirty instruments. Clean instruments should be together with clean instruments. Sterile instruments should be together with sterile, uh, sterile instruments. So this is sample of your logistic box. Your, your, your logistic box is considered dirty, okay? It is not considered clean because it goes to uh, different areas of uh, what you, storage area and logistic area, or it passes whatever area it goes. So it is considered as dirty area. If, for example, for your logistic box and you receive equipment going to CSSD, then you are not allowed to store this logistic box together with your clean boxes. For example, your uh, box for your Bowie and Dick test, box for your pouches, you cannot mix your clean boxes to this logistic box. Okay, guys, this is the sample of paper plastic paper arrangement. It should be on the side. Okay. So your paper, paper plastic paper, um, uh, paper plastic uh, arrangement, it should be like this, but if not, then you, you can flat it. Um, your outside pouch is considered, is it your outside pouch? For example, let's assume for this instrument that it, this is already uh, sterilized, okay? Um, is, the, is your outside pouch considered clean or sterile?
guys, your outside pouch, it is considered clean. Okay. Let's assume for this one that it is sterilized. If it is already sterilized, then your outside pouch is considered clean and your inside pouch is considered sterile. For example, guys, your doctor is working for uh, in a clean uh, area, so clean field, and your instrument, your inside, ins your inside uh, instrument, is steri sterile, right? If your sterile instrument, you will place it to a clean area or clean field then it will be it will not be any more sterile it will be clean okay if you place your sterile instrument to a sterile field especially in or they are creating any sort uh, even one day surgery they are creating a sterile field so if the, you are placing your instrument to a sterile field then it will be remain sterile but if, we, if, if you place this instrument, the inside instrument, to a clean, clean field, then it will be considered clean, not sterile anymore. So this is your sample of your sterile field. In OR, guys, the blue um, cloth or the blue cloth, or it is either a cloth or disposable, it is considered a uh, sterile. It is sterilized or pre-packed sterile. So they are creating a sterile field. So whatever instrument touch that field, it should be only sterile. Okay. So no clean instrument should be on that field because that is all sterile. No touch technique. No touch is a method of holding any sterilized instrument. Guys, it is now mandated, actually, um, it is mandated to have the no touch technique. It means when you are when you are placing the instrument to the autoclave, you are not touching or holding anymore the pack, uh, pack instruments. Okay, once you, you remove it in the autoclave, you will not again um, touch the pack instrument instruments. Instead, you will hold that tray when removing it in the autoclave and transporting it or storing it in the serial storage area, but the same as that one. And then when you are transporting it to the clinical areas, for example, OR or let's say delivery room, or ER or ward, then you will deliver it um, without touching the, the the package. So no touch technique. You are not allowed anymore to do like this. But in the clinic, yes, we are still doing it. We don't have those equipment yet. So please be reminded of these protocols. If ever it will come in the exam, it should be the mandatory, the no touch technique. This is your sample of your no touch tray. So once you place your packaging uh, packages there or pouches, then once you remove it, just you will see two handles on the left and the right. You, you will just hold that handle when placing it on the autoclave or remove it in the autoclave and placing it to the transport cart or to the storage cart, okay? This is your sample of your storage cart, okay? Once you place it, you will put uh, all the, the, the no-touch uh, script then uh, what do you, do you call this a moment a 
Okay. Once you uh, once you remove the package with the perforated tray, for example, this one, you will place it to this trolley or transport cart. Your transport cart is either B. You open or close. Your open uh, your open transport cart is prone to contamination. Okay, because it is exposed on the environment. But your transport cart, which is closed, this is the pre preferable one on the first uh, image. This is your closed transport cart. So your no touch perforated tray liner, you will place it directly on the transport cart. So once you remove and deliver the, uh, the instrument, you will just hand handle the tray tray liner or the perforated tray on the edges. I will show you the difference um, with the surgical hand washing and the medical hand washing. For surgical hand washing guys, actually it is um, it's a combination of scrubbing Okay, and contact time. Well, and hand uh, medical hand washing, it is only through friction and rubbing. Okay, for medical hand uh, for surgical hand washing, they are using a scrub. So if they are going to OR, most of your uh, if they are doing if they are doing procedures, if they have uh, surgical procedures, they they will do. Uh, Surgical hand washing before putting a PPE. So just watch for the surgical hand washing. This video is for training purposes only. Surgical site infections or SSIs remain a prevalent threat to patient safety. Surgical hand scrub or techniques are essential to decreasing its incidence. This video provides instructions on Surface 
10 strokes. Next, scrub the outside surface of the thumb from wrist to tip of the thumb, 10 strokes. Continue to apply 10 strokes to the other side of the thumb and to each side of your fingers. Once you scrub an area, do not go back. Now that you scrubbed your hand, it's time to scrub your arm on the same side. Mentally divide the forearm into thirds from wrist up to two inches above the elbow. Scrubbing each third of your forearm, apply 10 strokes to the top and bottom and both sides of each section. Like before, once you scrub an area, do not go back. Repeat the scrub on the other hand and arm. Once both hands and arms are complete, discard the surgical sponge in the trash can beside the scrub suit. Start rinsing at your fingertips and continue to the hand, forearm, and elbow in one forward direction through the water. Always keep your elbow at a right angle and hand raised above the level of your elbow. Do not move arms back and forth in the water. If you need additional rinsing, completely remove your arm from the water stream and re-enter at the fingertips until you reach the elbow. Rinsing is complete and no antiseptic remains on the hand and arms. Turn off the water and knee control. To avoid contamination, keep hands above the level of the elbow and away from scrub attire and non sterile surfaces. Allow residual water to drip off the elbows and into the sink. Do not shake or wave hands and arms to remove excess water. Walk backwards through the operating room door and dry hands and arms with a sterile towel before donning a sterile surgical gown and gloves. Okay, that's your surgical hand washing. The difference is uh, your surgical hand washing, you are using the scrub technique. So they are using scrub and they are using chlorhexid, uh, chlorhexidine or providon iodine. So in medical hand washing, you are just uh, using soap and water and the minimum contact time is 20 seconds for a total of 40 seconds to 60 seconds. Okay, you for medical hand washing, you can use medical hand, um, you can use soap and water or alcohol-based hand drum. So now um, I'll show you the video of medical hand washing for you to distinguish between the difference between the uh, surgical hand washing and the medical hand washing. Medical hand washing is usually done in clinical settings and even in the hospital uh, for CSSD technician or nurses not assigned in OR.
Okay, for standard precaution, for standard precaution, it means treating all body blood and body fluids as a, as if they are infectious. So you will treat all, all body fluids or blood that you may encounter as if they have Hep B, Hep C, HIV, or SAGD. So that's your protocol. The three most concerning bloodborne pathogen are Hep B, Hep C, and HIV. For Hep B, if it uh, if it is dried, then it can still transmit the virus. Until how many days it can transmit? If it is dried, for example, um, you hold your doorknob and it is dried, then your colleague touch the dried blood. Once he touched the dried blood and he has an open wound until how many days, once it is dried, it can still transmit the virus. Okay. For hep hepatitis B, it can still transmit the virus until seven days. For hepatitis C, it can transmit the virus until three weeks. So that's the reason why we are maintaining the CSSD room uh, before starting the procedure to do the surface disinfection or the environmental cleaning of the working areas. Okay, for CJD, it is commonly in um, for dental. For your CGD, it is believed to be a prion, which is an abnormal protein. It, it is a brain disorder that caused either Your CGD guys can cause um, dysfunction of your of your of your mo motor, which means um, it affects your brain activity. So, for healthcare professional protocols for hepatitis, for protocols for hepatitis for pre-employment screening, HB sub level will be determined if the staff needs a vaccine. Then, if your titer level is um, below 10, then you need a three dose of your hepatitis B. If your um, hep B titer fall on 11 to 99, then you need to have a booster dose. But if your if you if your tighter result is above 100, then it means you don't need any uh, dose of uh, Hep B vaccine or any booster dose. So your initial dose of vaccine or booster required determines it uh, as per your tighter result. So for traffic traffic control. So for traffic control guys, even surveyors or auditors should follow strict traffic control mean, means um, they cannot enter the CSSD room if they are not wearing proper PPE or if they don't have the proper scrub attire. If they don't have the proper scrub attire and they want to inspect your CSSD room, then they need to wear your shoe cover, your um, disposable gown, your hair net, and your mask, okay? If you are, dress code should apply to everybody, even your colleague, okay? If they are not wearing uh, uh, scrub attire, and if they are going to CSSD, then they need to wear a lab, um, disposable gown. And if they don't have the intended shoes for CSSD, then they need to wear a shoe cover. 
So if you are handling with biohazard items, you should take consideration with persons or client in the facility. You should give way for them. Okay, if you are handling or carrying biohazard items or contaminated instruments, you need to let them first go first before um, you take your way because you need to give way for your clients. So the contamination and point of use preparation, actually it's already discussed on the introduction. Okay, let's start with the user at the point of use. Who is usually the user? Who is usually the user? Okay, the user is your nurses, your physician, or your any healthcare related team. They are your user. Whoever uses the ins instruments. So your physician, nurses, any healthcare professionals, or any healthcare team. So they are your user. So the main goal of point of use is to prevent damage of instruments. Transporting an instrument even a few feet farther only must be consistent in proper handling and protocols of instruments prior sending it to CSSD. Goals of point of use preparation and transport is your removal of gross soil. Gross soil left on instruments make the instrument difficult to clean and can damage the instruments. So prevention of damage, soiled items must be prepared for transport that prevents instrument damage to instruments. So soil and excess moisture promote the formation of biofilm colonies. Biofilm is highly resistant to cleaning and disinfecting chemicals. So removing the cause of biofilm is essential. Biofilm is actually is a collection of microorganisms that it it will form a colony and put there there is a protective gel generated from this colony and it protects from any um, detergent or even heat or from the from the autoclave. So for excess moisture, guys, don't be um, don't mis misinterpret it. For excess moisture, because there are two types of ex moisture: moisture coming from soil and moisture coming from disinfectant solution. So you need to remove soil and excess moisture that promotes formation of biofilm. But you need to re retain. It doesn't mean. Um, you need to remove the excess moisture, then you will let it dry. You are not allowed to dry the instrument because it is hard to clean uh, the soil, which is your blood. Once it is hard, then it is, it is difficult to clean. So um, you need to keep the instruments moist, okay, using the disinfectant solution or a disinfectant foam. Or your enzymatic foam. So your user will spray on your instru instruments to maintain uh, the moisture of it and it is safe for handling. So responsibility of the user or your nurses or your physician whichever they are using the instruments is that to notify CS team if there is a defective instruments they need to notify you Second, should decontaminate instruments for safe trans transport means there is no bloody instrument should be transported to the contamination area. Your user or your nurse, your physician should pre-clean pre or pre-disinfect or pre-decontaminate your instruments. Remove, removing uh, any liquids, removing the soil, which is blood, they need to wipe it or they need to spray an enzymatic spray or a disinfectant spray. It depends on their policy. Should notify CS team for any known infectious diseases. If the patient has Hep B, Hep C, HIV, then your user should inform the CSSD that this patient 
has a hep B, hep C, or HIV or CGD because you need to separate the instruments when cleaning. Okay, you need to quarantine them and soak it different on different container before doing the routine process. So should notify CS team for defective instruments and needs repair or sharpen. So if ever it is not uh, cutting anymore, your scissor is not surgical scissor is not cutting anymore, then in the nurse should inform the CS team that it needs to be sharpened. But you know, guys, that it is also the responsibility of the CS team to check for the functionality. But the initial uh, information should rely should be relied by uh, by the nurses to the CSSD team. Should notify CS team if they need the instruments on what time. So the turnaround time, the the user should inform that uh, whenever they are they they need the instrument on what time, okay? Because there is a specific turnaround time for CSSD. For example, in CSSD area, uh, in, in the total process of sterilization, okay? From decontamination to sterilization, it will take at least one hour and 30 minutes because you will do manual brushing. You will do ultrasonic, uh, ultrasonic cleaning. You will inspect your instrument, you will pouch your instrument, then autoclave it. So it will run at least one hour and 30 minutes. So for there's a tag for sharpen, repair, okay? Usually we are using the repair and sharpen tag. So if ever your scissor or any sharp object needs to be sharpened, then you need to tag it with sharpen. And or if the instruments need for repair, then you need to tag it for repair. So this is the sample of your um, tag instruments. For example, it needs to be repaired. You still need to uh, brush it. You need, you still need to do the ultrasonic cleaning. Okay, then tag it for repair, pouch it, and then sterilize it. The reason why you still need to sterilize, sterilize instrument before sending it to any repair vendors because you need, as per infection prevention protocols, it should be safely, safe to handle, means it is free from any pathogens so that you are free from any infection. So let's, um, it is the user responsibility to distinguish which is reusable and disposable. Your nurse, your doctor should not send any disposable instruments to CSSD. So they need to throw it in hard-sided, okay, biohazard, biohazard bin or container, which is four sharp, okay? They need to dispose the disposable, um, for example, this one scalpel, disposable scalpel, the blue, the blue one is, is disposable. So if you are using the disposable one, it should not reach the CSSD because it is the responsibility of your nurse or physician, whoever using it, that it should be directly disposed upon uh, after usage. For reusable, if you are using reu reusable scalpel, then it should, the blade should, if it, if the blade is reusable, then you need to separate the blade in a separate container so that once the, the CSS technician will grab the instrument, they will not be punctured by or lacerated by the sharp object. So another uh, sample of your reusable and disposable is your syringe. For your syringe, they are disposable, which is on the below part. Reusable is on the upper part. There is no this. There should no disposable syringe that uh, that might reach CSSD uh, department or CSSD room or the contamination room. All disposables, especially sharps, should uh, disposable sharps should be disposed in the user room or in the clinical room. So the reusable 
if you if your nurse or doctor is using the reusable uh, syringe, then the needle should be discarded or it should be thrown in um, sharp container. Okay, because your even it is you uh, are re reusable syringe, your needle is disposable. It is one use only. So this is your sample of your um, sharp container. It marks biohazard. So if you can see there's a line full, it should be three fourths full. Once it is three fourths full, then you need to discard this sharp container. You don't allow it to full until the lid. So just on the line, okay? So this is your sample of your um, sharp container. It is a small part. If ever you have uh, what you call, if you have a, a reusable sharps, then you can place it wherever it is applicable on this uh, perforated tray. So this is a sample of your enzymatic foam or disinfectant foam. Guys, it is the responsibility of your nurse or your the user that before transporting the instrument, it should be disinfected or decontaminated. There's no blood and it should be kept moist. So to keep it moist, sometimes we are um, putting some spray or foam spray. It is a, either enzymatic cleaner or enzymatic foam or disinfectant foam. Okay, that's the sample how we maintain the um, how we maintain the moisture of the instrument using the spray. So it's, it's enzymatic foam or disinfectant spray are used to avoid instrument from drying to keep instrument moist to remove any contaminants for safe transport. So it is the responsibility responsibility of the nurse to um, to disinfect it before transport to remove any gross materials or before transporting it to CS department. So some of uh, some of the company protocols they are using disinfectant wipes. So they will remove the blood using disinfectant wipes. So it is already disinfected, but still, even it is dis disinfected or decontaminated, still you need to do the manual brushing upon reach, uh, reaching the decontamination area, and still you need to place it in ultrasonic cleaning or ultrasonic cleaner. This is your sample of your transport bin. Okay, your transport bin should be um, has a logo of biohazard, which is punctured resistant. Any sharps cannot penetrate this uh, container, and there should be there should has a lock. Okay. So, point of use preparation guidelines: open hinge instrument, deassemble multi-parts instrument, and place instrument in the appropriate tray in orderly manner. So, keep items together. Instrument sets or multi-parts items should be kept together for their transport to the CS decontamination area. So keep surface moist to prevent soil from drying on the surface. This can be accomplished by using commercial foam or gel spray. So empty fluids from container, it should, there should no fluids uh, from your container that might reach the CSSD room. So please be reminded that your any liquids can damage your instruments. So notify CST team for known infectious disease like HIV, CJD, and Hep B. Notify CS team if instruments needs for repair. Notify CS team about uh, instruments require, requiring turnover, turnaround time for next case. So this is the responsibility, mostly point of use preparation is the responsibility of your, of the user or nurse. So um, sending instruments to the contamination area it's either the CSSD will pick it up or the nurse or the user will send it to CSSD room. Okay, just a moment.
Guys, we are having a practice exam. So if you um, please answer and type your answer so that we can correct it. Okay, your first question is, for central service technician, should be familiar with which entity regulation on how to handle medical waste? Is it from A, the Joint Commission, B, from OSHA, C, for Environmental Protection Agency or EPA, or D, for Federal Drug Administration? So, Central Service Technicians should be familiar with which entity regulation on how to handle medical waste. Okay. Please type your answer so that we can correct. Okay, guys, what's the answer? Central service technician should be familiar with which entity regulation on how to handle medical waste. Is it the Joint Commission, OSHA, Occupational Safety Health Administration, Environmental Protection Agency, or Federal Drug Administration? So the answer is APA, okay? Environmental Protection Agency for, for the World Environment. So central service technicians should be especially concerned about handling regulated medical waste, and they should be familiar with their state and local requirements to do so. The, the Environmental Protection Agency regulates infectious medical waste management. So it's APA, even the, the uh, designated protocols of EPA is that to protect also and to monitor the um, labels of your chemicals, okay? So if it is hazardous to environment, then it is the uh, uh, EPA is the mandated authority or regulation or organization that regulates any activity that might uh has a greater pose a greater risk to the environment so the next question is When traveling through a biohazard area, what attire is required? Okay, when you are traveling through a biohazard area, what attire is required? Is it A, OSHA required PPE? 
B, surgical scrub and hair covering. C, surgical scrub, hair covering and mask. D, re regular street attire. Okay, what's the answer? Okay, when traveling through a biohazard area, since it is biohazard, which means this area is at risk in encountering any pathogens or communicable um, diseases. So the answer is letter A. So OSHA required PPE biohazard areas may be contaminated from used equipment, utensils, and instruments. OSHA required PPE is required in this area. Next is all of the following are recommendation for operating a washer, sterilizer, except. A, use detergent with a pH of between 7 and 10. Never use abrasive cleaner. C, detergent should be free rinsing. Detergent should be high sudsing. Okay, what's the answer, guys? Okay, all of the following are recommendation for operating a washer sterilizer except, okay, letter A, use detergent with pH of between 7 and 10. It is neutral to basic or alkaline, so it is accepted. B, it is never use, a, never use abrasive cleaner, yes. Um, it is a recommendation, never use abrasive cleaner because it can damage uh, if you are using abrasive cleaner, then it can damage your instruments. So detergent should be free rinsing. C. It is one of the recommendation. The reason why is that your detergent should be free rinsing. It means once you do the initial rinsing in tap water, the, chemi the chemicals should um, immediately be removed, easily be removed. So the answer is D. Detergent should be high sensing. So it is not recommended to be high sensing since it can cause bubbles. Okay? It can cause bubbles or foam on your detergent. So bubbles and uh, foam are not allowed in sterilizer or washer since it can interfere in the cleaning process. So it is 
it is extremely important to use the recommended amount of low sudsing, not high sudsing detergent. Use a high sudsing detergent or too much detergent will result in residue of, on the instruments. So the next is water soluble lubricants designed for surgical instrument were originally designed as which of the following for your lubricants. So if if you are in your uh, inspection area and you are lubricating the instruments, what is uh, what is it originally designed for? A is it rust inhibitors for drills? It means um, the rust will be inhibited or to prevent any rust. B, maintain the integrity of the instrument. C, prolong the life of the instrument. D, prevent abrasion on blades. Okay. Water-soluble lubricants designed for a surgical instrument were originally designed as which of the following? A, rust inhibitors for drills. B, maintain the integrity of the instrument. C, prolong the life of the instrument. Or D, prevent abrasion on blades. Actually, guys, this question is very difficult. Why? Why is it uh, very difficult? Because um, they give almost all the correct answer. So you need to choose um, the first or the initial purpose of the lubricants. Because they actually they give all options correct. So water sol soluble lubricants designed for, for surgical instruments were originally designed as which of the following? Okay, the answer is letter A. It is rust inhibitor. Actually, guys, the letter C is correct. Prolong the life of instruments. Because once there's no rust, it will prolong the, the life of the instruments. It also maintains the integrity of the instruments. It also prevents abrasion on blades. But first, before it, um, before it can maintain the integrity of the instrument, before it, it prolongs the life of the instrument, the lubricants will prevent, actually will prevent the abrasion, that's correct, but it is originally, originally designed to prevent any rust of the instruments. Okay, followed by prevent abrasion on blades, then maintain integrity and prolong the life of the instruments. All, all options are correct, but it is originally uh, designed to inhibit rust. Okay, that's the reason why, guys, um, for stainless steel instruments, um, the world's stainless steel, okay, to, may, to, to have the instrument uh, stain less or lesser. So it doesn't mean that uh, it is stainless steel, it cannot get a rust. It can still has a rust or stain, stain rust, but it will be lesser. Okay. So rust inhibitor for drills, so water soluble lubricants designed for surgical instrument were originally developed as rust inhibitor for carbon steel dental drills and were used to pre-coat them prior to sterilization. 
So the daily lubricants are an important part of instrument maintenance program because they maintain the integrity of instrument and keep in good working order. But they are originally developed as RAS inhibitor. Okay, next question is, ideally, which of the following should be utilized as the free rinsing agent to minimize the deposit of minerals that appear as water spots when, when dry. Is it distilled water, B, cold water, lukewarm water, or deionized water? Okay, please check the question. Okay, um, it said to be utilized as the free rinsing agent. So, to minimize the deposit of minerals, okay. What is your answer, guys? Ideally, which of the following should be utilized as the free rinsing agent to minimize the deposit of minerals that appear as water spots when dry? Okay, um, for letter A, I will start for the wrong um, choices, okay? Um, we will not use cold water or hot water, okay? Um, so we will remove cold water. Cold or hot should be removed autom automatically. So, Cold water is not uh, accepted in, uh, in any rinsing or any, um, li any uh, liquids or water, water used in CSSD. Lukewarm water, it should not be lukewarm. It should be, it's at least room temperature or cool water. Cool water is, it's not cold. Cool water is actually room temperature, okay? Distilled water, the remaining option should be distilled water and deionized water, okay? Your, your the question is, um, should be utilized as free rinsing agent. So guys, free rinsing agent is your initial rinsing. So your initial rinsing should be Okay, should be your tap water. Okay, but ideally, you can use your deionized water as your free rinsing or initial rinsing. So it should be deionized water, not distilled. Your distilled is your final rinsing. Okay, um, for deionized water, it is the same with distilled water, the minerals and deposit are removed, but for deionized water, guys, there's still bacteria, okay? There's still bacteria for deionized water. So it is used, even your tap water, there's still bacteria, okay? But the, the mineral deposit of your tap water is not removed. So it's either 
um, the ideal for initial rinsing is deionized water. Okay, before you will use the tap water. So deionized water for your initial rinsing and then your final rinsing is your distilled water. Distilled water is that it the minerals has been removed together with the bacteria. So the ionized water, ideally the ionized water should be utilized as the free rinsing agent to minimize the deposit of minerals that appear as water spots when When drying, free rinsing refers to the removal of any residue of cleaning agent, which means, guys, removing your chemicals. So from ultrasonic uh, cleaner, you will remove, you will um, rinse the instrument in a, for example, uh, tap water or deionized water. As first option, it should be deionized water and before tap water. Okay, free rinsing refers to the removal of any residue of cleaning agents and chemicals remaining after cleaning process and is necessary regardless of whether a manual or automated cleaning process is used. Even you are doing brushing or you are doing the mechanical cleaning, then you need to do, do the initial rinsing using deionized water. Okay, and final rinsing of your distilled water. So what is the be best way to ensure getting the best result with the correct cleaning methods? Okay. A, consult consulting OSHA website. B, consulting the department standard precaution. C, consulting the in instrument manufacturer written instruction. D, consulting the CDC website. What is the best way to ensure getting the best result with the correct cleaning method? Is it A, consulting OSHA website, B, consulting the department's standard precaution, C, consulting the instrument manufacturer instruction, D, consulting the CDC website? Okay. The correct answer or any methods of cleaning, especially in the instrument, it should come came from the instrument manufacturer, okay? And if the question is how to best use or what is the, uh, the best use of using chemicals on what equipment, what item, or what metals can be used or can be uh, used for these certain chemicals, steel, okay? It should be from the manufacturer or manufacturer of your chemicals oh, so you will refer it to your instruction for use manual so it's either chemicals or instrument the first option or the first answer should come from the instrument manufacturer or the chemical manufacturer so consulting the instrument Manufacturer written instruction, instrument delivered to the decontamination area should be cleaned either manually with use of automated washer or a combination of both instrument manufacturer or responsible for providing the written instruction for the decontamination of instruments as well as the test results verifying the instruments can be effectively decontaminated without posing any harm. So... For enzyme products, commonly used to clean heavily soiled items, amylase enzyme catalase, which of the which of the following? Enzyme products are commonly used to clean heavily soiled items. For amylase enzymes, catalase, which of the following?
So what is your answer, guys? Okay, what is your answer? For enzyme products, guys, are commonly used. There are different kinds of enzymes, right? For amylase, it catalyzes what? Okay, let's start with fatty deposits. For fatty deposit, what catalyzes the fatty, what enzyme catalyzes the fatty deposits? I think it's in your exam or quizzes. So what enzyme catalyzes your fatty deposit? So for your fatty deposit, guys, it is catalyzes by your lipase. Okay. How about your blood and mucus? Okay. Who catalyzes your blood and mucus? It's the same for blood and mucus. There are one um, enzyme that catalyzes the blood and mucus. Okay, for blood and mucus, the one who catalyzes the blood and mucus is your protease. So, the amylase catalyzes the starch. Okay? So starch, amylase catalyzes starch, protease enzymes break down blood, mucus, feces, and albumin. So for your lipase, down, uh, breaks down fatty deposits such as bone, mar bone marrow and adipose tissues. So if there is a possibility that a medical device will cause a temporary or reversible health problem, this is considered uh, reversible, which is uh, temporary or can be reversed. This is considered which class of FDA product recall? Okay, there are three only classes for that one. So if there's a possibility that the medical device will cause a temporary or reversible health problem, this is considered which class of FDA recall? 
There are two FDA classification, right? Okay, for the recall of defective equipment and for the risk. So, if there is a possibility that a medical device will cause a temporary or reversible health problem, this is considered which class of FDA product recall? Is it a voluntary, class one, class two, or class three? Okay, the answer is, okay, let's start with, op if you are reading questions, guys, please check the, the root questions of the, the main root questions. So, the question asked is asked for the FDA product recall, okay? Um, which class? Actually, it's already written, which class? So, it's either class 1, 2, or 3, okay? Voluntary. The recall of FDA, as we discussed on the first discussion, is that it's either voluntary or involuntary. So it means it's either the hospital or the manufacturer should inform the FDA or the FDA should be the one to inform the uh, manufacturer. So it's either voluntary or involuntary. So answer is it is class two okay so class two recall indicates less serious risk there is a possibility that the product will cause a temporary or reversible health problem or there is a remote chance that the device will cause serious health problems the manufacturer must notify customers and sometimes ask them to inform the product recipients. But please be reminded for FDA classification as per the risk of the devices, okay, there are two classes. So maybe uh, it, will, it can confuse you for FDA classification as per risk, okay. For class one, it is your low risk. For your class three, it is potential risk. So your class two device pose a potential risk or your class three is your high potential risk. But for as per recall, okay, as per recall guys, if there are defective equipment, then your class one is considered the higher risk, okay? Then the class three is the lower risk. It is um, opposite from the FDA classification. So for FDA recall, the class one is higher risk. For recall, the class one is higher risk, which is cause a irreversible damage even death okay for class two it is reversible it means it can be um if there is a damage it can be fixed for class three it can it's it cannot cause any damage or harm so please be reminded of the difference fda classification for uh risk of the devices and recall uh, risk as per recall okay Actually, risk, this, the, the second one is the risk as per recall of defective equipment. So, the next question is, the removal of any residue of cleaning agents and chemicals remaining after the cleaning process is known as 
removal of any residue of cleaning agents and chemicals remaining after the cleaning process is known as final rinsing, residual rinsing, free rinsing, or double rinsing. If we, if, um, if you, if you will go back to the, the first, uh, the question, you can answer this one. Okay. For example, this one, where is it? Um, here, it stays here as free rinsing agent. So the removal of any residue of cleaning agents and chemicals remaining after the cleaning process is known as What's the answer, guys? It's free rinsing. So free rinsing refers to the removal of any residue. The final rinsing is your distilled water. Okay? Your free rinsing is your deionized water or tap water. Okay? The second option is your tap water. The first option is your distilled water. For final rinsing, your first option is your it's either uh, pure water, distilled water, okay? For residual rinsing, even though it is residue of cleaning agents, residual rinsing is done in ETO or ethylene oxide. Ethylene oxide, you are using um, ethylene, ethylene gas, so you need to rinse the residual of the ethylene before um, before removing or before removing the before emptying the chamber i mean because it can cause any um, ethylene oxide can cause combustion or it can cause fire for double rinsing actually the double rinsing is not commonly used in cssd though we are doing the double rinsing which is the the initial rinsing and then the final rinsing but it is a uh, term as free rinsing or initial rinsing or your final rinsing. So the next question is, only deter detergents that have been spe specially formulated for use in ultrasonic cleaner should be used in them. They must be all of the following except. A, formulated with surfactants. B, low foaming. C, formulated with chelate, chelating agents to prevent redeposit of soil. D, allow for slow controlled soil removal.
So what's the answer, guys? Okay, on, only detergents that have been specially formulated for use in ultrasonic cleaner should be used in them. They must be all of the following except. Okay. Okay, let's rationalize. Every, um, formulated with surfactants, yes. Detergents are formulated with surfactants, any detergents. Low foaming. In ultrasonic cleaner, it should be low foaming. That's correct. It's low foaming. So formulated with chel chelating agents to prevent redeposit of soil. Okay. That's correct because once it cleans the instrument, so it has the um, it has a special agent that the soil cannot be attached again to the instruments. So the fourth option is allow for slow controlled soil removal. So the answer is except is not included is your letter D. Allow for slow controlled soil removal because it should not be slow. It should be rapid soil dispersion it should me it means it should be removed rapidly okay so ultrasonic are using sound waves so using detergents it should be removed rapidly so the answer is letter b so allow for slow controlled soil removal only detergents that have been specially formulated for use in ultrasonic cleaner should be used in them. They must be low foaming to prevent interference with the cleaning process. These, deterg uh, these detergents are usually formulated with surfactants and chelating agent to prevent the redeposit of soil. They should allow for rapid soil dispersion, not slow controlled soil removal. Okay. Acid turns, acid turns litmus paper what into what color? Okay. So for acid, in what color it will change? The litmus paper will change to what color if it is acid? Is it a blue? C yellow, a B yellow, C purple, and D red. So acid turns litmus paper what color? So guys, the original color of the litmus paper is, there are three, three colors. It's either blue, it's either, either red, or it's either yellow. So the yellow is your universal. Your blue your blue is your um, it's usually used for acid, okay? The in initial color of blue. For initial color of red, it is used for alkaline, okay? For acid, the original color is blue and it will change to 
red if it is acid or acidic. For your litmus paper red, okay, for your litmus paper red, it will change to blue if it is alkaline. So the answer is letter D, red. So, just check on the image. For litmus paper, it is, it is like uh, purple, but it is blue. Guys, for litmus paper red, which means the on the right side, the original color is red. So, this test is for acid. When it changed to blue, When it changed to blue, it means it is alkaline. Okay, on the left, uh, on the right side of the image. So if it is originally blue, the litmus paper is originally blue. When you sub, when you submerge the litmus paper to the liquid, then in if it will change to red. And it is it is means it is acidic, okay. When the uh, litmus paper blue doesn't change to blue, it means it is alkaline. So in order to check for the acidity of the uh, water, so you need to use the litmus paper blue. And check for it, submerge it. Once it turns to red, it means it is acidic. So if you are checking the alkalinity of your um, water, if you are using the red litmus paper, then it should be changed to blue, which means it is alkaline. Guys, I think we are done. We will resume on um, January 24, Friday, for the next topic, and January 25, Saturday. So just be reminded. Um, for your Purdue account, please um, go to your module online and answer the pretest and postest on your each of your module. Um, I can see the activity on your um, Purdue account. So there are one one student only that I think uh, just a moment. If I will show you, okay, I will show you the the tracking so that you are aware. Can you see it, guys? Can you see the Can you see the tracking of Purdue account? Yes, sir. Um for those blank 
it means that um, still they did not start the, the pre-test and post-test. Please try to finish all the programs in for due account. Um, I think it's only Miss Marik Marikita uh, done the try to finish it. If you don't have time, guys, please do the module one. Please do the module um, at least thirty minutes per day, or at least one hour per day. For example, um, for your module one. For your module module one, okay, just a moment. For your module one, there are five parts. Okay, lesson one to lesson five. So, if in order to because the lecture is very, uh, the lecture of Natalie Lin is quite interesting and it can be easily understood. So try to view your uh, each lesson part. And try to answer your um, pre test and your review quizzes. Okay, for your progress test, if you can, if you can proceed with the second module without uh, taking the progress test of module one, then try to go to the module two first before attempting the progress test in each chapter. So finish all module before you are going back to the uh, progress progress test. So we are monitoring your grades actually, um, and even your activities. So please um, manage your time, how you can view the videos and lectures in Purdue, uh, Purdue Online. It can help you a lot in the exam process, guys. So. I'm hoping for your next uh, next week for next week that all your um, you can finish in either two module of your Purdue online. Okay, try to manage your time. How you can manage it? Um, try at least one one to two hours per day. Just uh, checking for the video checking for the lectures online and answering the pre-test and post-test. Do not attempt the any test if you are not ready because I can see I can see if it is uh, how many attempts you made. Okay. So So for your um, next Friday, for January twenty four, we will discuss the cleaning, cleaning and decontamination, and disinfection. So I separated it because uh, for disinfection, there's a lot of chemicals to discuss. So it's either I will show you some videos of each equipment, how to operate it. How, um, how to check or test each of it, uh, but I'm I'm collect I'm collecting all the videos from YouTube. Actually, um, there are some videos that you can see in YouTube, guys, so that you can visualize all the equipments and chemicals. So try to finish. Um, your module one and two 
on your Purdue online until next week if you can manage so that you will not be behind. So guys, do you have any questions? No. Before we will end the, the lecture for today. Do you have any questions? Please for your please as Please go to your Purdue account. Please uh, answer them. Use them because most of the videos and discussion are there. Okay. It, it is coming from Natalie, Natalie Lin, which is the educator of Ishams. So please check on it and then um, try to answer the pretest and post post us without fail so that um, we, we will be on track. I will try to double the schedule by this week so that we can um, we can still catch up with the schedule. So it's the 24 and 25 is final. I will add some lecture top, uh, lecture days so it will be recorded if you are not available then you can view the, the videos. After that, we will show some practice tests, the same as practice tests as I showed you, but it will be plainly practice tests. So um, just to remind you, the same with the questions uh, you encounter today, there are some questions that you might encounter that they will give the same correct answers. All correct answers. So we are just check, uh, checking how to prioritize them. So what is the first option? What is the first answer? Ideal answer before going to the second or third options. So I think that's all for today. Let's meet on January 24, Friday, 10, 10 to 12 or 10.30 to 12 for the continuation of chapter eight and nine. And then uh, Saturday 25 will be on, I'm not sure yet if, if we can cover the, if we can cover the module three, all of the module three, because this is the important topic, especially the chapter 10 to, well, so I, I think I will divide this again with chapter 10 and 11. And then um, 12 to 13. So expect that on 24, it will be chapter um, 8 to 9. And then on 25, it is, it will be chapter 10 to 11. And then I will add some additional dates and I will inform you guys. Thank you for joining our class for today. Um, please don't forget to answer the your Purdue account. I'm monitoring it. I'm checking it. I'm evaluating all your progress. I can see all your exams, exam attempts. I can see if you are if you failed for the first attempt or you failed for the second attempt. Okay. Thank you guys and see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.